Hello everyone, I am Aksake from Reality Beyond Dreams and I'm here with Anila from The Incredible You. We are here today to celebrate the world's environmental day. Uh, it's a very special day for both of us and for every one of us uh, if you care about the environment like we do. Uh, and I think it's very important that we celebrate this day like we celebrate Eid and every other festival because this is our planet and we have no planet B to go to. So I think it's very important that we, uh, we keep in mind the climate crisis right now, in front, right in front of us, the, the crisis that we, cannot, no, we can no longer ignore. I think we, each one of us has to play a role in preserving the ecosystem, in making this planet a planet for every species, not just for the animal, not just for ourselves. You know, and uh, this environmental day, we are here with a, an amazing film from called Ria Nature by Melanie Challenger. And the film is an incredible film and we were really moved by it. And I would uh, give it to Anilosh to tell you more about the film. Okay, thank you, Aksai, and hello everyone again. Uh, the film that we are going to screen today is called We Are Nature. It's a short film on the environment and um, the challenges that we are, our world is facing due to the climate crisis. And uh, this film is created by Melanie Challenger, an independent filmmaker from the UK. She is a philosopher. She is also a published writer. And one of her very famous books is called uh, We Are Animals. And she is an outspoken activist for animals' rights, for the world's rights, and for environment. So we are very excited to screen the film today. And the reason we decided to uh, screen this film today on the Environmental Day is because Melanie has a very unique take on the overall discussion that is going on around the world during the, this COVID, the pandemic situation. And uh, I'm not going to tell you what is her take because I want you to watch the film and find it out for yourself that what is her take. And I think it's very important that at this point in time, we have this conversation in every part of the world, in every activist, every individual, every artist, every filmmaker, all the institutions, we come together and we start talking about this environment. And I am very excited. Aksa is thrilled that you could see for uh, to celebrate this environmental day together with all of you here and everyone across the world who are celebrating today. So let's watch it. Let's start the film. Also and, on um, one point I okay. want to add. Yeah. So the most exciting part is like Melanie will be there uh, yeah. to discuss the film and talk about more about what was going on in her mind when she was making the film and what's the philosophy behind it. So I'm super thrilled about it because I'm really a philosophy buff, if you know. You know. But I, I think it's going to be an amazing discussion. I think you guys should stick around and let's watch the film. Yes, of yes. course. In early 2020, we found ourselves in the midst of a global pandemic. Nobody knew where the virus had come from, but one thing was certain. Somehow, somewhere, it began with us. There is so much out there in the natural world, and we're part of it, and we rely on it. And we may think that nature is something separate, and we can distance ourselves and live in our little bubble it's not true. You know, we get a lot of talk in terms of man versus nature, um, civilization versus uncivilized, the ways in which we try to hold ourselves other from nature is problematic because we are nature. Where do novel viruses infecting humans come from? Everything comes from somewhere and new viruses for humans come from wild animals. We know that. Wild mammals and birds probably carry about a million and a half viruses that we haven't even seen yet. A world of viruses. So all of the disruption that we commit 
against wild diverse ecosystems increases the likelihood of new viruses getting into humans. People's impact on the planet has consequences. And because we're encroaching into wildlife habitat and traveling at an unprecedented rate around the planet and consuming products, meat, agriculture, livestock production, deforestation, road building, is also growing at an exponentially expanding rate. And that drives an increase in pandemic risk. So whenever we go into wild, diverse ecosystems and start capturing animals to take to market, killing wild animals for food, cutting down trees for timber, establishing timber camps, little villages, uh, mining camps to extract mineral resources, to extract fossil fuel, wrecking the ecosystem, disturbing it, we expose ourselves to the viruses that the wild animals carry. These patterns of our exploitation and consumption are proximate causes. They tell us how something's happened, but they can't tell us why. To understand those ultimate causes, we need to look at how we frame our relationship to nature. The value framework that is most responsible for this whole problem is the framework within which humans see themselves as detached from nature, as apart from nature, as above nature, and not as part of nature. It's kind of like human exceptionalism. People want to think that humans are exceptional. And I always say all animals are exceptional, but they want to place humans above and separate from other animals. And we need to recognize that humans are animals. Every aspect of how we deal with pandemics sets us as apart from nature. You know, we talk about zoonotic diseases, we talk about them coming from animals into people, but we're animals too. Um, we talk about them coming out of the environment into our communities, but we're in the environment. You know, we hear so much talk about nature these days, but not everybody around the world sees nature in the same way. And, and some communities and some individuals are given much more voice than others. There's a pretty clear delineation between sort of those that value the environment um, as something that humans should have dominion over, control over, that we are, we are here on this planet to sort of steer and guide the environment around us. Um, often that, that correlates with sort of a separation of humans from, from nature. Um, and then there's the total other side of the coin where people feel deep connection with nature, that humans are very much part of the natural biotic community, um, and that we have an obligation and responsibility to treat nature with respect um, and, and, and recognition of our interconnectedness. Indigenous communities globally have millennia of experience stewarding their ancestral lands and that rich knowledge around sustainable ways of relating to land and also, you know, relating to land as ancestor, not as an inanimate object, not as a commodity or something to extract from for human gain, but really something that reflects the health and well-being of humans. One thing that nobody's talking about as much as they should is that pandemics happen because of the way two animals interact with us as one of those animals. So one thing we absolutely need to rethink is our relationship to other species. So it was very convenient for many people to believe that animals were just things, just objects, without feelings, without emotions because then to do the terrible medical research that has been done um, to put animals into intensive factory farms, to hunt them, shoot them, kill them, eat them, sports hunt them, all of these things aren't so easy if you actually believe that you are dealing with a sentient being that has feelings, that has emotions, can feel fear and pain and despair. You know, I'll talk about animals as who, so it's who we're eating, not what we're eating. It's who we're dealing with in conservation projects, not what we're dealing with. And when you start using the word who, it really invokes this idea about sentience and feelings. One silver lining 
of the pandemic is that it has created an opportunity. The other thing that's come out of this pandemic um, is just a real awareness of our interconnectedness as human beings around this world, um, as well as the need um, to understand that we are so dependent on the non-human beings that also share this planet. Well, I hope that people will begin to realize that we need to behave differently, that we need to emerge from this pandemic as we will with a new respect for nature, the natural world and animals, and realize that we cannot continue to treat nature, to treat animals in the way that we have been doing. We need a broader framework of value. We are part of nature. Nature has inherent value just as we have inherent value. It's not an all or none sort of thing. It's a matter of balance and degrees and connectivity. Without that, we're in big trouble. Throughout the making of this film, with much of the world in lockdown, we've had the opportunity to see what follows when we release our hold on the Earth. However briefly, we've witnessed a quieter, cleaner world. But there's been little meaningful change in how many of our leaders talk about nature. There's still a refusal to examine the destructive values that shape our world. Nature remains a resource to be used for our benefit something we own, rather than something we are. That needs to change, or the cycle of disruption will continue. First, we went and ravaged the earth, and we ignored those who spoke out because we didn't understand our relationship with the earth. Machupo virus, 1961, Marburg, 67, Ebola, 76, HIV recognized, 81, Hendra virus, Australia, 1994, uh, Nipah virus, 1998, boom, 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 and goes on. I think this pandemic is really, um, if there's any good side, and it's, to be honest, it's hard to say there's any good side but if there's any good side it's animals coming back into their homes and cities and towns it's and it's people needing connection so i think the more that we can empower different indigenous communities to to do that and make decisions in the ways they've traditionally been very successful in doing um the better i hope that the pandemic has given many people time to rethink how we interact with the natural world. Here we are on, in the third segment of today's um, premiere, and uh, we have Melanie, who is the writer and director of this film. We are very excited to have you here with us, and we are really excited to talk to her, her about the film and learn more about her perspective and kind of like dive deep into what she's trying to tell us and learn more about the message she's giving. And I know it's a very short film and it does, she did not, she might not have like enough opportunity to kind of like dive deeper into every topic that she touches throughout her film. And uh, here is an opportunity to talk to her and to learn more and to dig more. So uh, Melanie, thank you very much for joining us today. Well, it's lovely we to be here. We are very excited to me. have you here. The, like your film is really amazing. It's wonderful. So let's start with your introduction. You could tell us a little bit about your background, who you are, where you look forward yeah. to, you know, what, where do you see yourself in the future? And then we'll move on to uh, yeah. discussing the film. Sure. So my name is Melanie Challenger and I, I'm a writer primarily. Um, 
but my work is really on, it started in environmental history and it moved progressively into environmental philosophy. And I do a lot of work now in ethics. So environmental ethics and bioethics. Um, and I'm a member of the Nuffield Council of Bioethics, which is the UK's major bioethics body. So, you know, bioethics is really about looking at all of the ethics with regard to how we relate to biology, to nature, to life sciences, all of those sorts of things. So it could be genome editing, it could be farmed animals, it could be all of those sorts of things. So that's my sort of work. Um, I've written a few books that have all really been environmental history um, and philosophy. So I wrote a book called How to Be Animal, which was all about trying to recognize that we are organisms ourselves that we are reliant on the rest of nature that we're a part of nature but that we have lots of ways in which we try to keep ourselves separate and what follows if you bring everything closer again so that was and then a book I wrote a book called on extinction which which was really about looking at a young person's perspective because I was quite a bit younger then on the biodiversity crisis and just the anthropocene actually the way in which we have become estranged from from nature and and become a destructive force um, for all the good that we can do but broadly a destructive force in, in terms of affecting earth systems and and uh, pollution and, and and other species and the ability of other species to thrive so this film really you know we found ourselves in obviously I trade in these ideas all the time but I found myself in the lockdown and I found lots of people asking questions about you know, connecting with nature for the first time because everything was stilled and everything was silenced and we were kept in our spaces and, you know, trying to, you could see that people were re-evaluating, people were rethinking their relationship with the rest of nature. But at the same time, even though at this point in time, we don't know the origins of this, this particular spillover of a virus, we do know um, that emerging uh, diseases have been increasing over the last hundred years or so. We do know that the vast majority of those have come through some kind of disruption of the natural world. So it could be wildlife trafficking, it could be um, high level wildlife farming, it could be wet markets, it could be deforestation. Um, with, this, with this virus, there are a lot of unknowns, but we, we know that somewhere along the lines, a human being was interacting with a non-human animal and you know, in, in ways that were not ideal. And, and we've ended up with, with a disease that is affecting us precisely because we are animals too. You know, we can get it, minks can get it, gorillas can get it, tigers can get it, you know, because we're all interconnected. So really the film was, was initially came from the fact that I think this is an inflection point and we wanted to, to try and capture that as best we could. Very cool. And uh, just on a side note, besides the uh, the recording that we are doing for the show, amazing film, like especially the quality and everything, all the effort and thought you put into the film. It's yeah, like yeah. you can see it while watching it. So thank you so much. I would like uh, now Aksa to, uh, you know, like ask her question. So uh, hi, Melanie. Uh, it's nice hi. to see you again. Yeah, so I, I just wanted, I want to ask you about this, um, how, like, how does a, uh, like, writer decide to make a film? Why do you choose this medium as a, as something that you want to uh, convey your message? Because I know filmmaking is really important and it's huge right now, but for climate reality right now, how can we use this platform or this medium to further yeah. the cause or how what do you think was going on in your mind when yeah. you were thinking okay i'm going to make a film even though i'm a writer but let's yeah. make a film it's a great it's a great question because um you know i work in philosophy ultimately mm -hmm. and philosophy is really requires not only it's a lifetime practice for starters you know it's not something you can just put into 140 characters on Twitter, you know, it, it, it lends itself to a book because a book is really a, a sort of mini brain. It's an, it, you know, it's a big form. And films don't do that. Films are visual, they're impactful. They can be very short and they can provide opportunities to grab people and get people to 
and grab them emotionally because they're visual um, mm -hmm. and then you hope that they will go to books that they will go to discussions that they will go to citizens assemblies that they will go to other spaces mm -hmm. where the opportunity to deepen their understanding and ground their understanding in in further knowledge is is there but why film for me after all of these years is because i'm extremely passionate about what we might call deliberative democracy. So the opportunity for general publics, for everybody to be a part of the decisions that affect our lives. And for it not just to be expertise, it not just be stakeholders, it not just be politicians and people with power and corporate power, but to do that, and I'm so I'm very involved in how we can engage people with ethics, engage people with the knowledge you know that they need to make informed decisions about what they buy about what you know how they are as consumers what their actions are how to empower people to make choices that will influence those who do have the majority power how to vote all of those sorts of important decisions so providing spaces to think about these ideas and i learned you know there was I'd assumed, you know, I'm a writer, so I'm always like, read books, right? That's my, my point of view. But at the same time, I had to recognize a number of years ago when I was trying to engage people, public, you know, engage publics, that I, I, I looked at, this was actually more in bioethics, it was looking at genome and gene editing and, and really Ooh. wanting people to be empowered, to be involved in that sort of thing, but also Ooh. climate science. And what I found when we looked at what publics have been saying, and this isn't just in the UK and Europe, this is actually in lots of different countries. So similar facts in, I don't know about Pakistan, but certainly in India, I know. Mm -hmm. People were saying, we don't know as much as we want to know. Um, we don't know where to get that information, but ideally we would get that information through TV or film. And I guess that's because it's a very, you know, um, concentrated way of of showing people what they need to start to think about so that's what I think film is really good it's like a hand that reaches forward grabs people and and hopefully takes them into other spaces that they can do the thinking you can't do everything on film you know you need to then go back to books you need to then go back to Env environments where proper deep thinking can happen and then through you know that you can act in some way in your community but film is a great starting place to get people to reflect mm -hmm. and like a follow-up question so what do you think like filmmakers from these communities like or on the ground communities what do you think they could do to amplify the message or accelerate the process of getting more people involved in the process of uh, decision making and getting in strategic thinking about climate crisis and being actually involved, not just on papers, but being actually involved in the um, decision making and how to steer away from this crisis. So. Yeah, I mean, there's two, there's two routes that I see. So one route, um, and, and they have advantages and disadvantages. So you probably need to use both in parallel. So for filmmakers who are really passionate about issues that really matter, to a certain extent, getting out there, being budget free, you know, being budget free, doing kind of indie making and getting content out there, exploiting the dem democratic nature of the internet, of the platforms that are available, is a way of being free of anyone controlling your message, allowing you to have a very um, mm -hmm. honest and authentic take on, on and so we need that to be happening, that independent world of, of content making and, and a, a swell of it. It doesn't matter if one film only gets 500 views and another film gets 50,000 views. They all work together in building a cultural momentum for change. So they're all valid, they're all valuable. Um, but the other thing that you can do that's probably more directly high impact is to be a filmmaker, but join in with someone who is established, like an established NGO, who's doing work that you care about, who already has a, a platform or a credibility and provide content for them because a lot of big organizations are wanting that kind of thing. And so I think, you know, there are two routes. One is the kind of, I guess the mainstream, mm -hmm. more of a mainstream route and the mm -hmm. other is the indie route. And I think they're both equally valuable. Um, mm -hmm. Because obviously as soon as you map, you, you, as soon as you join in with a 
a big organization you're going you, you know there's going to be some element of control in what you're able to do mm-hmm. with your content but so both are, are needed um and also i do feel that we need diversity we mustn't have one person or one set of organizations or one country one nation one world view we really do need to um amplify diverse voices um small voices that are doing certain kinds of things that won't necessarily go viral and and big voices as well we need all of it um and yeah i think you kind of that that's what what i would say Mm -hmm. thank you so much for this answer i guess a lot of our filmmaker friends will uh, take a lot of inspiration and guidance from this so anila you if you have yeah thank you i mean wonderful answers and i was writing down a few things that you mentioned during the talk and it was also in the film and one of the things in the film that really caught my attention was it was so truly uh, portrayed that you know the like everyone's talking about um, economic recovery, social recovery, they are fighting to, you know, come up with solutions to fight the pandemic. And it's understandable for the short term. But uh, the talk, this discussion about environment, our uh, interaction with environment and the influence we could have had and how it has changed during the pandemic and that was the one thing we really wanted to do absolutely i'm really glad you say that because ultimately there's so much that you could do with this but we wanted to just get one message across to people and it's quite it's really quite a simple message and it isn't giving this you know people want to be told straight away absolutely i'm really glad you say that because ultimately there's so much that you could do with this but we wanted to just get one message across to people and it's quite it's really quite a simple message and it isn't giving this you know people want to be told straight away what the solution is but we couldn't do that with this because we're asking people to critically examine their value systems we can't tell them what their value system ought to be we're in telling people that you everything that you're talking about economic recovery um yeah. you know um climate policies pandemic preparedness which may be looking at everything from how we do biotechnology how we do you know how we do how the biomedical community work but it could all, it, but it's also looking at ecosystems and how we're interacting with ecosystems and picking out where are the danger points for pandemics all of those sorts of things and the same with the climate crisis we're constantly looking at what i am calling proximate causes proximate causes tell you how something's happened as we say in the film but they cannot tell you why and if you never look at the why so essentially what i'm saying there is a proximate cause is explaining the actions that have led to something it doesn't explain for us as human beings, the motivation for the action. And unless you resolve what justifies an action in the first place, unless you understand that there is a value assumption, there is a paradigm, there is uh, a set of ethics or principles or whatever it might be that are giving you permission to do something destructive, unless you tackle that and you get that out into the open and you think, well, could we as a species have a different paradigm, a different way of thinking about it? Could we do that in a really global way you know which still respects diversity respects cultural worldviews but actually acknowledges that we are all in this together um and can we have a new way as a species on a real species wide frame of interacting with the rest of the living world and seeing our our, well unless we look at that critically um we will only be ever be deferring the damage to further down the line um because you can fix the economics in this system but you know i I worked on industrial history so i if you look over hundreds of years you know everything from the kind of roman empire where you look you drop in on the kind of industrial revolution and what followed from that when you look through time like that what you see over and over again is that if we only deal with those proximate causes you'll just have a little further down the line a new set of policies come in and we do something even more destructive you know because you've not understood the destructive paradigm underneath it all so that's what we really wanted to get people to engage with so cool so um 
So for you, this film was just like um, an initiation of at least a discussion that, you know, people like us also talking about it in addition to like we expecting institutions to talk about it. Because yeah. usually it's like we expect institutions to be the change makers, but the way it usually works is people are rooting for it and they yeah. are wanting the change. They are demanding the change and then institutions respond to it. So Absolutely. it's like for filmmakers like you and like uh, for a team like RBD, when they take on projects like this, which has a vision and which has, which, you know, triggers the change on a smaller level. And then, you know, it's like the snowball effect and it goes around the world. And it's like, by the time, you know, you are already causing the change and you are getting attention from the institutions that you think that it's their responsibility to start yeah. the discussion, to work for it. But at this time, if they are blinded by all the challenges that they see up front, it's our responsibility who are sitting in our homes and who are watching all of it on social media, on entertainment channels, that what they are up to and what we are dealing with. So uh, very cool. And uh, Aksa, do you have a question? Meanwhile, I can, I'm going to ask one more question after you. Okay. Uh, no, you go ahead. I'll ask after this. Um, so my um, question was, uh, because the film is short and it touches so many topics, and um, so what is one or two key things that you really want people to take away from this film? Does it, it would it be like, why did pandemic happen? Or is it more like, uh, what is the solution? And what should we be doing in future? Yeah. Or just yeah. how being aware that how our relationship has changed with nature over time and even during pandemic. Yeah, so I think the main thing is the first thing is wanting people to stop and recognize that we have reached a tipping point now where um, both individual action and the actions of all of us together on the planet are no longer sustainable. And all of the policies in the world have not to this point in time made a real difference. So the only way we can move forward now is to completely rewire our brains. You know, we need to actually think our way into ecosystems, think our way into the natural world in a completely new way. Now, I spend a lot of time talking to people from lots of different cultures, including First Nations, for instance, and, you know, in a lot of a lot of First Nations, you know, people might come back and say, well, we're already seeing ourselves as, as embedded in nature. And, and, you know, we don't have such a kind of um, separation in our minds, which I totally respect and I understand that. Um, but the reality is that over 75, well, no, that's not true, but heading towards 75% of, of the world population now live in urban spaces. So most of us are living, like a huge proportion of us are living in environments where our action and the impact on the rest of nature is, is, has been separated out. So we have to make that visible again. So the film is partly about saying, well, that this little invisible virus has made visible how broken that is, how damaging that is. But we can't stop at this now because the pandemic will go away and incredible forgetfulness will sweep over us again and it will be business as usual if we're not careful. So we have to stop now and we have to think our way back into nature and that is going to require actual proper, proper thinking. We have to totally reimagine that relationship that we're going to have with other animals. I think that's a real key one and probably that would be my punchline that I think you know we cannot get away with treating other species as though they have no meaning other than an instrumental one for us so we have to rethink their their you know um, right to live and to to exist and our relationship with them we need to rethink what we're taking and we need to rethink the whole idea of what human progress and meaning looks like so that's those are the key kind of take-home messages 
I have just one last question, and I guess okay. uh, so the question is like, how do you how do you think these voices, like the film, like yours, and these voices who are who are like demanding an alternative way of life, I guess compared to the million and billions of dollars that corporations are spending on selling the exact things that might be the cause, like the biggest cause of the uh climate change so how do you think our voices or these films are going to create the impact that we want in yeah. in the world or we can influence those these people yeah. with our messages when they are putting like tens and billions of dollars yeah so i think this is this has been this is an age old problem So how do, how do citizens, how do individuals who feel powerless and oftentimes are and might have none of the kind of um, accumulated wealth that gives you a completely disproportionate amount of impact on the world as an individual? Um, I think the only, the only way we can do it is cumulatively together. So you talked about it earlier in terms of the, the way that value shifts happen. Value shifts have always happened, even though those who have the most to lose, so the people who are monopolizing the power or the resources or doing the unpleasant thing in the first place, and maybe that we could think of something like slavery as an example of that, or you know, the actions of empire, for instance, you know, those are all examples historically of where deeply ethically troubling um, actions have eventually you've been able to fight back against them. People who've been utterly powerless have been able to fight back. Or it could be female emancipation, it could be any of those sorts of big, you know, um, moral value shifts that have taken place in history. Usually what happens is you do, you have a range of people culturally who are thinking about it, who start publishing or talking about it. It could be anything from a pamphlet to now, our equivalent of that, which would be short films, which are kind of like pamphleteering in a way, if you like, creating mm -hmm. social action, social impact. That sort of starts to bubble up so that enough of us know that an injustice is taking place. And then basically you have to, as a, as a, as a, um, mass together not as individuals but as a mass together then you recognize that you are the votes you are the consumers that ultimately if you will not facilitate their world for them um, in in knowing or unknowing ways that's where your power lies that it becomes untenable for them to retain their power or and and they have to you, The sadness of large societies and the ability in large societies for people to monopolize power in any kind of way is that, of course, you're often only ever pushing that corruption somewhere mm -hmm. else. It'll pop up again and we'll have to deal with it again mm -hmm. further along the line. But you can create big, big kind of value shifts through, through mm -hmm. that you know, a sufficient threshold being reached where everybody can work together and recognize that we actually can hit people on votes, we can hit people on what we choose to consume and what we choose to do. Um, and also making it so morally problematic that it's not something someone wants to be allied with any longer. It's, it's a paradigm or an idea that people, you know, don't want to be seen as a part of anymore. That's another power, which is really a social power, if you like, but it basically becomes deeply uncool to continue to do that. Mm -hmm. It becomes toxic, if you like, to their reputation. And that's another source of power. But in the end, it has to be cumulative. Well, thank you so much for this answer. I think a lot of uh, our filmmaker friends and a lot of people who are interested in filmmaking, I see a lot of shift in Pakistan to about this climate change and the, uh, although the consumption in the general public has not changed, it's still a lot of things are same as usual. But there is a space where people are talking about these issues and a lot of good films and people are still talking, like people are talking about making films, people are talking about these on the ground realities, 
talking about them and also like capturing the essence of what is their story how are they making a difference how are they being resilient and the stories of resilience against what's already happening in these communities i think it's very important for the to form a global narrative also but also to be inclusive and embrace this as a global challenge is something that all the humanity has to face thank yeah. you so much melanie for joining That's us it's been a pleasure melanie lois <laughs> Thank Who's you for having for, me. Um, oh, I have a question. <laughs> <laughs> I have to I do I have to go in a moment, but yes, go on, fire on in. <laughs> one last question. So I just want okay. to ask one personal question. Uh, if you could tell sure. us, or the people who will be watching, is if you could tell us about your journey to making we our nature. Like, was there yeah. a point in your life where you felt, oh my God, I've I've been disconnected or i've been consumed by the everyday life and the rat race and then you were all of a sudden you it was like a, an epiphanic moment oh, okay or, yeah you've been a writer but i expect uh, that you have always like most of your life you've been aware in you know of your surroundings but was there a moment where you felt like oh my god Well that's interesting I mean in not in terms of this film so I mean the making of this film you know we really did it on sort of zero budget in really difficult circumstances because you know we just wanted to make something Chad is a friend of mine um who I made it with and Chad is a, is a DOP so he he does this all of the time so he had his cameras you know and we live near one another we just got outside and we did what we could outside in lockdown when we were able to and then we we just connected with people who we thought would be able to give us a little piece we weren't trying to get people with um antagon- antagonistic points of view we were really trying to all sing together diverse voices but singing together on one note to a certain extent um so we just did the best we could like everybody else creating stuff at the moment in the circumstances of the pandemic but in terms of my relationship with nature broadly as a thinker like so i i was started in the creative arts so i did literature at university and i was writing poetry i mean i continue to work in the creative arts or particularly in music and classical music um but very early on i was very concerned about using the arts in social action so the first work that i did was actually much more in conflict and i worked with a, a dear friend of mine from bosnia zlata filipovic and who was in the siege of sarajevo and we produced sort of various things together that were really about trying to um use writing to um increased tolerance and you know so that was in my early 20s so I was always involved and then I worked with the Anne Frank diaries and produced a choral work um again in my early 20s so I was always involved in sort of social ways of uh, but my big love was always nature but I actually grew up in a you know in an urban environment my nanny my nan my grandmother she was very much part of an older generation where they were connected with nature but i really recognize that we my generation weren't that much anymore um and even many colleagues that i have now who work in in environmental you know they don't necessarily know what flower they are seeing you know on their local patch or what you know they're not necessarily brilliant naturalists you know because we just have lost so much of that now and a lot of our lives you know separate us away from the kind of slow process of really bringing the life around you alive and understanding and knowing what you're looking at um so for me i i went to antarctica i was a writer in residence in antarctica with the british antarctic survey and that was um international polar year and it was probably seeing you know a lot of i was surrounded by climate scientists it was probably seeing for myself what it would realizing that in the ice you know you could pull out a core and you would find our pollution within it was just such a wake up call for me um that and at the same time coming back from this sterile cuz antarctica is incredibly harsh it's very very cold it's very very windy it's like the driest windiest coldest place you can be there's no vegetation to see there's you know it's really hard for people to live there and i came back to the spring and i saw the flowers 
And I just wanted to fill in everything. I wanted to understand every flower I was looking at. I wanted to understand every bird that I could hear. And I started down a path that was many years ago now to, re, to, to build up my natural knowledge again. And that process has been an ethical process as well, you know, where, I, you know, I don't just look at what I see. I have to think about why we should care and how we can protect it. But that was probably the moment for me that made the really big difference. Awesome. So I think uh, Zoom is also giving us the <laughs> heads okay, up that you need to go. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you very it's much for joining us. Thank you so much, Melanie. For... You. Yeah. Thank you for it's your time, Melanie. Thank you so much for and happy holidays. I hope you enjoy the nature as much as you want. <laughs> thank, 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 thank you so yeah, much. Stay in touch joining. with me, you guys. Yeah. Yes, yes. Okay. Thank you. All right. Thank you. What the solution is, but we couldn't do that with this because we're asking people to critically examine their value systems. We can't tell them what their value system ought to be. We're in telling people that everything that you're talking about, economic recovery, um, you know, um, climate policies, pandemic preparedness, which may be looking at everything from how we do biotechnology how we do you know how we do how the biomedical community work but it could all it, but it's also looking at ecosystems and how we're interacting with ecosystems and picking out where are the danger points for pandemics all of those sorts of things and the same with the climate crisis we're constantly looking at what i am calling proximate causes proximate causes tell you how something's happened as we say in the film but they cannot tell you why and if you never look at the why so essentially what i'm saying there is a proximate cause is explaining the actions that have led to something it doesn't explain for us as human beings, the motivation for the action. And unless you resolve what justifies an action in the first place, unless you understand that there is a value assumption, there is a paradigm, there is uh, a set of ethics or principles or whatever it might be that are giving you permission to do something destructive, unless you tackle that and you get that out into the open and you think, well, could we as a species have a different paradigm, a different way of thinking about it? Could we do that in a really global way you know which still res respects diversity respects cultural worldviews but actually acknowledges that we are uh, all in this together um, and can we have a new way as a species on a real species wide frame of interacting with the rest of the living world and seeing our, our well unless we look at that critically um, we will only be ever be deferring the damage to further down the line um, because you can fix the economics in this system. But, you know, I, I worked on industrial history. So I, if you look over hundreds of years, you know, everything from the kind of Roman Empire where you look, you drop in on the kind of industrial revolution and what followed from that. When you look through time like that, what you see over and over again is that if we only deal with those proximate causes, you'll just have a little further down the line, a new set of policies come in and we do something even more destructive, you know, because you've not understood the destructive paradigm underneath it all. So that's what we really wanted to get people to engage with. So cool. So, um, so for you, this film was just like, um, an initiation of at least a discussion that, you know, people like us also talking about it in addition to like we expecting institutions to talk about it. Because yeah. usually it's like we expect institutions to be the change makers, but the way it usually works is people are rooting for it and they yeah. are wanting the change, they are demanding the change and then institutions respond to it. So Absolutely. it's like, for filmmakers like you and like uh, for a team like RBD, when they take on projects like this, which has a vision and which has, which, you know, triggers the change on a smaller level. And then, you know, it's like the snowball effect and it goes around the world. And it's like, by the time, you know, you are already causing the change and you are getting attention from the institutions that you, Think that it's their responsibility to start yeah. the discussion to work for it but at this time if they are blinded by all the challenges that they see up front it's our responsibility who are sitting in our homes and who are watching all of it on social media on entertainment channels that what they are up to and what we are dealing with so uh very cool and uh, Aksa, do you have a question meanwhile i can 
So I'm going to ask one more question after you. Okay. Uh, no, you go ahead. I'll ask after this. Um, so my um, question was, uh, because the film is short and it touches so many topics. And um, so what is one or two key things that you really want people to take away from this film? Does it, it would it be like, why did pandemic happen? Or is it more like, uh, what is the solution? And what should we be doing in future? Yeah. Or just yeah. how being aware that how our relationship has changed with nature over time and even during pandemic. Yeah, so I think the main thing is, the first thing is wanting people to stop and recognize that we have reached a tipping point now where um, both individual action and the actions of all of us together on the planet are no longer sustainable. And all of the policies in the world have not to this point in time made a real difference. So the only way we can move forward now is to completely rewire our brains. You know, we need to actually think our way into ecosystems, think our way into the natural world in a completely new way. Now, I spend a lot of time talking to people from lots of different cultures, including First Nations, for instance. And, you know, in a lot of a lot of First Nations, in the, you know, people might come back and say, well, we're already seeing ourselves as, as embedded in nature. And, and, you know, we don't have such a kind of um, separation in our minds, which I totally respect and I understand that. Um, but the reality is that over 75, well, no, that's not true, but heading towards 75% of, of the world population now live in urban spaces. So most of us are living, like a huge proportion of us are living in environments where our action and the impact on the rest of nature is, is, has been separated out. So we have to make that visible again. So the film is partly about saying, well, that this little invisible virus has made visible how broken that is, how damaging that is. But we can't stop at this now because the pandemic will go away and incredible forgetfulness will sweep over us again and it will be business as usual if we're not careful. So we have to stop now and we have to think our way back into nature. And that is going to require actual proper, proper thinking. We have to totally reimagine that relationship that we're going to have with other animals. I think that's a real key one and probably that would be my punchline that I think you know we cannot get away with treating other species as though they have no meaning other than an instrumental one for us so we have to rethink their their you know um, right to live and to to exist and our relationship with them we need to rethink what we're taking and we need to rethink the whole idea of what human progress and meaning looks like so that's those are the key kind of take-home messages. I have just one last question, and I guess okay. uh, so the question is like, how do you how do you think these voices, like the film, like yours, and these voices who are who are like demanding an alternative way of life, I guess compared to the million and billions of dollars that corporations are spending on selling the exact things that might be the cause, like the biggest cause of the uh, climate change. So how do you think our voices or these films are going to create the impact that we want in, yeah. in the world or we can influence those, these people yeah. with our messages when they are putting like tens and billions of dollars? Yeah. So I think this, is, this has been, this is an age old problem. So how do, how do citizens, how do individuals who feel powerless and oftentimes are and might have none of the kind of um, accumulated wealth that gives you a completely disproportionate amount of impact on the world as an individual? Um, I think the only, the only way we can do it is cumulatively together. So you talked about it earlier in terms of the, the way that value shifts happen. Value shifts have always happened, even though those who have the most to lose, so the people who are 
monopolizing the power or the resources or doing the unpleasant thing in the first place and maybe that we could think of something like slavery as an example of that or you know the actions of empire for instance you know those are all examples historically of where deeply ethically troubling um actions have eventually you've been able to fight back against them people who've been utterly powerless have been able to fight back or it could be female emancipation it could be any of those sorts of big you know um moral value shifts that have taken place in history usually what happens is you do you have a range of people culturally who are thinking about it who start publishing or talking about it it could be anything from a pamphlet to now our equivalent of that which would be short films which are kind of like pamphleteering in a way if you like creating social action social impact that sort of starts to bubble up so that enough of us know that an injustice is taking place and then basically you have to as a as a as a um mass together not as individuals but as a mass together then you recognize that you are the votes you are the consumers that ultimately if you will not facilitate their world for them um, in in knowing or unknowing ways that's where your power lies that it becomes untenable for them to retain their power or and and they have to you, the sadness of large societies and the ability in large societies for people to monopolize power in any kind of way is that, of course, you're often only ever pushing that corruption somewhere mm -hmm. else. It'll pop up again and we'll have to deal with it again mm -hmm. further along the line. But you can create big, big kind of value shifts through, through mm -hmm. that you know, a sufficient threshold being reached where everybody can work together and recognise that we actually can hit people on votes, we can hit people on what we choose to consume and what we choose to do. Um, and also making it so morally problematic that it's not something someone wants to be allied with any longer. It's, it's a paradigm or an idea that people, you know, don't want to be seen as a part of anymore. That's another power, which is really a social power, if you like, but it basically becomes deeply uncool to continue to do that. Mm -hmm. It becomes toxic, if you like, to their reputation. And that's another source of power. But in the end, it has to be cumulative. Well, thank you so much for this answer. I think a lot of uh, our filmmaker friends and a lot of people who are interested in filmmaking, I see a lot of shift in Pakistan to about this climate change and the, uh, although the consumption in the general public has not changed, it's still a lot of things are same as usual. But there is a space where people are talking about these issues and a lot of good films and people are still talking, like people are talking about making films, people are talking about these on the ground realities, they're talking about them and also like capturing the essence of what is their story, how are they making a difference, how are they being resilient and the stories of resilience against what's already happening in these communities. I think it's very important for the to form a global narrative also, but also to be inclusive and embrace this as a global challenge. It's something that all the humanity has to face. Thank yeah. you so much, Melanie, for joining That's us. It's been a pleasure.